68. Fishing in the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. Our next major milestone is 200 Patreon supporters. We are only 68 members away from achieving this goal. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a jackhammer chatterbait, all Patreon supporters will receive 20% off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off Catoctin Creek Custom Rods. You'll also gain access to our private Facebook group community, members-only content, weekly Patreon supporter giveaways, and so much more. For more information, click on the link in the episode description or click the link above my head. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing in the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and we're traveling back again to Ground Zero with one of the, the OG guests in the OG place. We're back at the Shenandoah River with the man, the myth, the legend, Travis Eden. I love his name here. It's Travis the Bass Layer of, of Kingfisher Guide Service. Uh, Travis, you've been a busy man lately. Yes, very busy. Uh, you know, I booked 23 trips this uh, this month. I've had to cancel or reschedule, uh, you know, five, maybe five trips uh, due to weather, bad weather, bad river, river conditions and stuff like that. It's it's absolutely awesome to see that you've you've had this string of of success with so many guided trips. And it really also is just to how much work you put in. And also how well the Shenandoah is fishing right now. Uh, If you guys have not checked out his Instagram or Jake's, you are pulling out some monsters. Yeah, we've been pulling some big fish out uh, with the nice thing is, is that, you know, the Shenandoah is uh, right now, in my opinion, is a bit ahead of the Potomac as far as uh, the spawn is is concerned. I've been on the Potomac, the upper Potomac there at Harper's Ferry, and yes, it's you know, there's definitely some fish that have spawned uh, up in there, but um, you know, with the high water that the Potomac saw back here in late March, early April, uh, has kind of, I, I believe, has timed uh, the their spawn off. And it only takes, I mean, it's like less than two weeks for these eggs to be laid, and for them to hatch, and for the fry to leave. So it's a, it's a pretty quick turnaround. So as we're recording this, guys, it's the last week of April. This is being uploaded like the first week of May to give just some context as you're listening in here. Uh, what kind of water temperatures are you seeing right now on the Shenandoah? Um, you know, in the in the low 60s uh, is what we're seeing right now. And uh, connection. Oh, sorry about that. And, um, you know, it's it's staying pretty steady. Uh, you know, we're, we're in it and, uh, you know, as long as we don't get a threat of, of, uh, you know, some high water event, uh, to come along and, uh, you know, uh, totally do off with a, uh, year class of fish, uh, we'll be in pretty good standing. So I guess where we, where we left off there was when they spawn on the river, how do they spawn? Do they spawn like in lakes and stuff where it's that perfect circle in shallow water? Uh, you know, I mean, from what I understand, I mean, they'll go up to, you know, eight to 10 feet deep to spawn, not necessarily in shallow. And they'll go as, as shallow as 10 feet, or I mean, 10 inches of water. I've, I've, I've heard, I've seen some fairly shallow, uh, nests, but no fish on them. Uh, you know, at the time this was after, you know, I guess everything, everyone had spawned. Um, so, but it is on fire right now. I mean, lots of fish, you know, we're, we were uh, we had a perfect storm last Friday and just had tons and tons of fish to the boat. Uh, you know, a great day. But every single one that was caught, you know, it, they were released as fast as we could. So we did catch one tagged fish too. That was kind of cool. Wow. Yeah. Are you are you catching bigger size than you normally do this type of year? Because it's just. I'm seeing you post bigger fish than normal, like fours, fives, oh, and I think almost a oh, six. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally, man. This is like, this is the time where you're going to catch those big ones, um, you know, for sure. I mean, it's, uh, you know, that's that's just what it is, man. It's uh, those big ones are out moving around. And, you know, I think generally they're the first ones to do the spawn, you know, because 
you know, they're, they're the, the bigger of the, of the rest of the fish. And then I'm still seeing plenty of fish with, um, you know, smaller females with, uh, you know, bellies full of eggs. So, you know, that'll be the next wave, you know, to, to be spawning. And then I also understand that they will, sometimes females will, uh, uh, you know, after they've spawned and laid, laid eggs, they either maintain eggs or make new eggs just in case we have a, uh, you know, kind of as a prep, if we have a, you know, hot water event and they have to do it all hmm. over again. But I will say, How? I did speak to Jason Halliker um, via uh, messenger and uh, mentioned something. It was back in, I guess, late March, early April and mentioned something about, you know, lots of big fish. And he said that the, uh, he said we were probably seeing a lot of the 2014 mega spawn is what he called it. That's insane. So, I know. I, I just, I just threw a bunch of information at you. <laughs> yeah. It, it, that's fascinating that we're in 2024 and that's 2014. So what? 10 years, 10 years ago. Yeah. Yep. 10 years. So there's, get there's, that big. Yeah. There's lots of big fish out there. I mean, lots of them. Um, you know, I've heard of some really, you know, very sizable records. I heard of a 5.7 being caught on the Potomac. Uh, Six on the South Branch, a uh, couple sixes I think coming off of the uh, uh, South Fork. So, you know, those fish obviously are older than that uh, 2014 spawn, but uh, you know, those are pretty impressive sized fish. Especially that it's not just one. I mean, I believe you caught one on one of your pictures that you said was six. So that's yep. multiple fish in that weight category on the same river. Yes. Yep. Same rivers, you know, I mean, I, I mean, really the yeah. Potomac, you know, the Shenandoah, I mean, you know, is just, is it's a part of the Potomac. I mean, it, you know, granted it's, it's large, it's the largest tributary to the Potomac. Uh, so both have been very, very impressive uh, rivers here as of late. How long do you think the spawn will go on for before it segues to just a pure pr a post spawn bite and then segueing, of course, into summer? Um, you know, I mean, I believe we've probably got a couple more weeks left of some really good fishing, maybe more, you know, like I try to divide my time up between the Shenandoah and the Potomac. Uh, I don't want to beat a section, uh, to death every day, you know, like I've got five days coming up here. I'm not going to hit the same section five days in a row. Mm -hmm. Uh, I like to move around too, you know, it's, it's kind of boring when you're on the same section day in and day out. No, that, that, yeah, like I didn't even think about that for you, where you have to be on the same section day in and day out. You start learning some of the honey holes, and you're probably like trying to chase after sometimes the same fish because this isn't the Susquehanna or the, the yeah. size and volume. Yeah, yep. You know, in the Potomac, you know, the section of the Potomac sections, I should say, of the Potomac that I do, you know, much larger than the Shenandoah is at its widest point. So, um, you know, I like to, like to hop on over to the upper Potomac and, you know, fish a day, fish a few days here and there, um, you know, especially on that river because it is so much water. You're not doing the same, same exact route, uh, you know, day in and day out. What section of the upper Potomac do you usually float? Is it like above most, Harper's Ferry? No, mostly, mostly there on, at, at Harper's Ferry. Oh, wow. Yeah, Dan 3 down to Brunswick. It's a good stretch. Where do you launch? Where do you launch at Dam Three? Uh, River Riders has a campground called Harper's Ferry Family Campground, oh. and you can get a uh, a, a um, you can get a day pass. Uh, you know, if you wanted to put in there, but I will say it is not for the faint of heart. That stretch, uh, you know, I hear of you know kayakers. I get kayakers in the boat and. Uh, you know, they're like, that when, once we get out there, they're like, yeah, we're not doing this in a kayak. Because it is, uh, it drops 30 some feet from the dam down to Harper's Ferry. So steep gradient, uh, a good place to get yourself in trouble. As a matter of fact, I had a, did a kayak, uh, rescued a couple kayakers last year, uh, who were out in wreck boats, uh, recreational kayaks, uh, 
trying to fish. It was early May. They had on, you know, all of their SPF clothing, uh, you know, which does not uh, keep you warm. And um, had I looked up, the river was at, uh, eh, it was close to five feet. And the water temp was in the upper 50s. And they, um, I, I looked and looked upstream, saw a kayak could pull in. My client said, hey, that guy's awfully brave being out here in a kayak. And I looked upstream because I could see him looking upstream. And I looked upstream and I could see two, two yellow wreck boats, the bows bob, bobbing out of the water and immediately knew something was not right. And, uh, Put, you know, luckily I had my motor and I motored out and I was able to get two of the guys uh, in safely. The other guy ended up swimming all the way down past Whitehorse uh, Rapids and he Damn. was above Harper's Ferry. And uh, you know, one, the one, first guy that I tried to get out, um, you know, he, he wasn't doing so well and uh, they had PFDs and they had. Um, uh, their PFDs had inflated, and evidently the uh, manual blow tube was left open, and so they inflated and deflated. And um, uh, got the one guy on the boat, and you know his his knees were purple or blue, you know his lips were blue, so he was like on the verge of hypothermia. Water temp was in the upper 50s. Now the mm -hmm. air temp was in the probably mid 70s, but you know you get submerged into that water and uh, for that for a, an extended amount of time and uh, you know to really you know he was like i said he was going hypothermic and we got everybody safe and and everything uh down past white horse rapid and uh um uh, immediately i made him take off those fishing shirts those quick dry spf uh fishing shirts ring them out and i started handing jackets out because i that morning i started out with uh with a uh, you know fleece jacket on and um you know i wasn't i wasn't in the water swimming in the water and so but everything was everyone was safe uh you know there was some bruised egos and stuff like that and you know i asked the guy the one it was funny because one guy said we shouldn't have been out here he was asking me a question and it was kind of like oh <laughs> what do you think man you you came close to losing your life when you run into situations like this on the water I mean, who do you call? I, 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 like, honestly, I'm thinking to me because I'm on the water a lot. And if I ever see something like this, yeah. is it is it a 911? Do you call a river keeper? Like, how does. I mean, yeah, it would be a, like a 911 call. Uh, the problem mm -hmm. is, is that and they do a lot of drills and stuff out there. Uh, the fire companies, uh, they get their they get these, you know, uh, inflatable jet boats out. And uh, sometimes they even have helicopters out. I think the, two weekends ago they had a bit of big exercise out on the river and I've been out before and um, I was like August or September of last year and down at um, uh, what was it the uh, Brunswick uh, campground boat ramp they were doing drills down there they had two helicopters and they were doing airlifts and stuff like that but the problem is is that you know when somebody's in trouble I mean you, you're not going to wait you can't wait for the you know, emergency services to show up and, you know, they rely heavily on, you know, whoever's out there. And, uh, you know, there's been more than one time that, you know, there's been issues, especially around Harper's Ferry, uh, you know, with people, you know, I mean, every year somebody drowns there and, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's just a symptom of what's going to happen unless you had those guys on the ground with the boat unloaded and stuff like that. Uh, to lend a hand, you know, anything after that, I mean, is without that happening is, is, you know, ends up being, you know, a body recovery is what, you know, turns into. Wear layers, everyone, when you get out there, have a change of clothes with you. If you're going to be out in that super cold water, like get a dry suit. I think uh, Jake, Jake Hartwell and, and Jeff Green or Jeff Little talk about that a lot. Like just yeah. wear the right stuff, wear the right stuff. Yep. Yep. And, uh, in, in wear the right stuff, tell somebody where you're going and make sure you have a buddy. I mean, that's, that's half the battle, uh, right there is just having an extra person there just in case you do get in trouble. 
uh, you know, put some dry clothes in a dry bag and stuff it in your, uh, you know, stick it in your kayak or your canoe. Got to be safe even now. I mean, like, you know, you, got, you wouldn't want to go swimming in that water right now in the, in the lower 60s because it's cold. What water temperature would you deem like safe for people? Oh, I mean, it would have to be in the 70s. 70s at least? To, yeah, yeah. Yep. Right now, when you look at the rivers, what is a what is the average flow rate that you're seeing? And I guess we could start with the North South Fork main stem, and we could do Potomac, and just whichever yeah. ones you know of. You know, right right around three feet right now is what we're all running. I think the Potomac, uh, the Upper Potomac, right now is running at, at maybe three and a half. I did not, and I checked the gauges religiously, and I, that's one thing I did not do today. I had a lot on my plate and didn't have that time to. Uh, you know, pull up the gauges, but, uh, yeah, you know, three feet, maybe a little bit less, uh, is what we're, what we're going at right now. Uh, it was really good when we were at four, as far as my boat's concerned, I can move it around and it's slowly as the water starts to drop, it's chasing the, uh, the, the jet boat guys off. Um, you know, there's still jet boat guys down there at Brun, putting it at Brunswick and going up to, uh, I, I did see a guy up, up above, um, Knoxville Falls uh, yesterday. Wow. That's brave. Yeah. That is really yeah. brave. <laughs> yep. And that's a, that's another thing, a, you know, good thing, Thomas, that you touched on is there's a lot of Facebook groups out there, like local for, um, you know, the Shenandoah and the Potomac. And, you know, it's good it's good for guys to get on that stuff and to ask questions. And a lot, a lot of people do ask questions you know like i've got a prop boat what's the what's the lowest i can run my prop boat at on the river you know and you know just so you don't end up becoming a statistic you know and it's hard because like i even had a, a patreon member ask me about floating from algonquian down towards the bend and mm -hmm. i just you know i i i know jeff green really like that's his haunt so i asked him just to double check he's like i think this is safe but i want to ask you yeah. this guy wants to do this float like how gnarly are those rapids? And and it is. Yeah. It's just it's a safety thing. You got to make yeah. sure that you're going to be safe when you're doing that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. H have you ventured to the North or South Fork at all? Just before I ask uh, questions I did, about that, I, I did. I did a stretch of the South Fork. Uh, it was the. Let me see. Uh, it was the first. I believe it was the first. Uh, Sunday of April. I so did the, South the, la the last time you and I talked about that was during the dry up. The drought last August and September and it sucked and mm -hmm. it was bad. Yeah. And now this year we had the forest fires up that way. Like how, yeah. how is the fork doing right now? I mean, I think it's doing well. Uh, it fished really well. And, uh, you know, um, you know, there's two young guys that, uh, that run the, um, uh, South Fork a lot, you know, they seem to be doing pretty well out there. Oh, big, yep, yep. Yeah. yeah, those guys are yep. killing Daniel, it. Daniel, Daniel Litwin. So, but yeah, we did, we did well. Uh, you know, the guys that I had in the boat, eh, you know, it was more of a, you know, real fun float. Not so much, uh, you know, blinders on and we're going to fish. Is, is there a certain time of year that all those branches play differently? Or is the whole river fish the same? Uh, I mean, I think definitely there's times that those branches are, or forks, uh, you know, will fish uh, differently, you know. And I've, I've had to, at times, uh, if the South Fork or the North Fork catches a lot of rain and uh, it, the water comes up and they might be pumping a bunch of dirt into the main stem, and I have to avoid the main stem at all, you know, at all costs and end up uh, picking one of those forks uh, to run a trip on, you know, because it's the, the one, you know, one of, usually they both don't come up really quick. I mean, they do, both of them at the same time, but you've got that mass nut mountain range, you know, that runs the middle of the valley and kind of really, you know, holds, holds, you know, one one's going to be up or the other is going to be up. Um, and, uh, and that, you know, like, again, that'll, that'll dump a bunch of dirt into the main stem. Uh, that was the whole thing with the, uh, uh, hook shots video. 
I was about uh, to bring that up. Fork. Yeah, the South Fork was up, and so we had to go to the North Fork. How frustrated was he with you with, with making that decision? He wasn't frustrated at all. He was he was fine with it. He was, you know, very very understanding that, uh, you know, stuff happens. And there's no way you can control it. And that, that's funny that, uh, you know, we're talking about that because I've had my past couple of times I've had clients in the boat and they have mentioned the same thing about booking a trip, you know, out, you know, a couple months away. You just never know what the weather's going to be or what the river conditions are going to be. How many days were you given to do the hook shot episode? Uh, three and a half. Oof. Three and a half. So we so we fished uh we fished two full days and we had a half day and then we had like a half, actually it was more like three but we had three we had two full days out on the water a half day on the water and then uh, a half day of uh, you know just the side interviews for you know so that it could all be edited into the video. So did you do one full day then on the south and then you decided to make make the call to go to the north? No, we did both days on the north one. Cuz we went we went out for the half day was the first uh time out and we went out on the main stem and it was running at like 6 feet. And uh you know it was kind of it was tough fish fishing conditions. It was dirty. South Fork was pumping dirt into the main stem and so uh you know called the buddy up and you know, the ace in a hole, he said North Fork was looking great and they caught 40 fish the day before and we moved everything to the North Fork. Dude, and that's where just understanding the river and having these choices, which is really good for you as a guide. And because you have the the raft, you have the ability to do Upper Potomac, North Fork, South Fork, or, or the main stem, just depending. Yeah. The, 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 last, the last big thing then really is like bait selection right now. What what are you asking your guides to take with you to bring with you on the boat? Uh, what am I asking my guys to bring on the boat? Yeah, so like, what are your top three baits, basically? I, I, I don't I don't ask them to bring anything. They <laughs> just need to show up with a fishing license. Because <laughs> uh, I, I I've got it all, you know. I've got the rod yeah. and the tackle, and you know, snacks and drinks and lunch, and and so uh, they really don't. The lunches are good, guys. Yeah, the lunches are good. I can, I can, I can attest to that. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, uh, right now it's uh, it's it's tubes. It is, uh, you know, for a good bottom finesse bait, tubes, and then for some really moving baits because I mean the fish are eating. You know, they're chasing baits down, um, and they're they're chasing stuff all the way back to the boat. Um, and uh, so, as far as moving baits. You know, swim baits, flukes, jerk shads, uh, something along those lines, and um, spinner baits. So, when does the bite? Because I've heard this, I've had a few river people on, and it's so interesting when they're like, at some point in the year, generally speaking, smallmouth will start targeting more, it becomes more of a finessey thing, like the stereotypical Ned rig, the tubes. Is that a, a post spawn summertime thing? when they get into that funk? Yeah, I mean, I can't say. I mean, they'll, you know, fish will chase uh, regardless. And, you know, usually that, that more finesse style of uh, fishing, I mean, especially a tube or a net ring, I mean, it gets it done year round. Um, but, you know, there'll be a point in time here in another, you know, probably month or so where I'll just kind of put the, put the tubes down and we'll grow... Uh, you know, we'll grow, we'll grow moving baits, but I mean, there's times where, you know, they just don't seem to be looking up, uh, for those baits because, you know, small mouth's eyes are kind of oriented down and, um, you know, there'll be times where they're just finicky and you got to throw that tube, you got to throw that Ned rig because they just don't seem to want, you know, uh, uh to chase baits or anything. They want to, you know, pick stuff up off the bottom or, you know, out of those current flows. When does the topwater bite start start getting hot? I mean, I mean, you could catch them on topwater now. Really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. You throw it, they'll they'll eat it. 
you're not going to pick up as many bites, in my opinion, as you would, uh, you know, if you're throwing a fluke or swim bait or, uh, you know, more finesse. How long do you give an area this time of year before you move? And I know, you know, because you are always on the water and you guide, you probably have this instinct with that. But do you do you sit in an area because you know there's big fish or is it a couple casts and you just move on? Well, it kind of depends on the stretch, how long the stretch is uh, and what kind of time we burn up. You know, now, man, out there, I've got some areas where, I mean, I'll spend half the day in a one mile stretch. Mm. And then, and then after that, you know, it's, it's time to, you know, run and gun is what I call it. You know, I tell those guys, you know, we're going to run and gun, you know, so we're not throwing tubes. We're throwing, you know, moving baits because, uh, you know, when the boat's moving, it's, it is tough to fish a tube. Not everybody can do it. And, uh, you know, it takes a little, it takes a, you have to have a knack for it. Uh, if there's a learning curve there, cause you know, if not, you know, your bait's getting, getting hung up and stuff. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. I was out Friday and we did just that. We spent probably three hours and just like a one mile stretch. And then the rest of the time, like we kind of slowly as we moved down the river, started picking up more speed. Uh, and you know, some of, some of that was in part to the, uh, hellacious, uh, tailwind that we had. <laughs> that wind. That tailwind was insane. Um, yeah. it feels like every weekend it has been windy. <laughs> windy. Yes. Yes. And I mean, it beats me up, man. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, it, it can beat you up. Uh, you know, my new, my my uh, replacement boat after the fatal uh, hole being punctured in the other boat um, was uh, it it has a really high bow and stern kick, and so uh, it made it's like in the wind. Rafts aren't the greatest in the wind, anyways, just because there's not there's only a, a you know three to four inches of it sitting below the surface. The rest of it's sitting above the surface, you know, so that wind just blows and it really blows your boat around. You know, I know even, you know, a, a John boat or a, a, you know, like semi V hull or something like that, you know, get blown around. And I don't think they get blown around as bad as what a raft does. Yeah, that's true. Because I look at like inflatable kayaks, it's the same thing. They can get shallow, but they also are so, yeah. they get tormented by the wind. Um, and, and, you know, the funny thing is, Thomas, is that, like the Harper's Ferry stretch, because they run a lot of tubers through there, and you can you can, you don't even have to know the wind is blowing. If you look at the river, you can see which way the wind's blowing because there's tubers when it when the tubers are out, <laughs> <laughs> they all start moving to one side yep. of the river whether they want to or not. <laughs> I I had a I had Peeler on uh, a month ago I think I think you were in the comment section and we were talking <laughs> yeah. about those tubers. Do you yeah. think on the main stem, they just get used to that crap, the small mouth where, all right, yeah, there's another yeah, person yeah, in a yeah. bikini. I mean, I mean, I, you know, they're, they're wary, they're wary, but you know, uh, you know, small mouth are not one to just, you know, generally just pass up a meal. Uh, you know, they've got to get their, get that feedback on. And, uh, and so, I mean, I have caught fish running baits by tubers. Um, they weren't necessarily the biggest fish. So just skipping a chatterbait off of a, off of a tuber. That, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> when you have these mile stretches, um, and let's just say there's a riffle on the top and the bottom. When that bite turns off, is that just because the fish are just shut off? Or is that because they somehow left that stretch? Do those fish leave and go up the riffle or, or below the riffle to the next pool? Oh man, I think I think some of those fish just shut down. You know, they're just like, yeah, no, I'm not going to eat anything right now. Uh, you know, and you'll feel as you're out there. I mean, like the bite will go, it'll get hot to where it's just bang, 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 bang. I mean, you're just whacking fish left and right, and then it'll get cold. And you know, so there's windows throughout the day. The window opens, and you catch a fish, and then the window shuts, and you know it's. 
tough to bite, tough to even buy a fish. That makes sense. Yeah, because I've always wondered about that when you have those those sections, what happens with that. Um, but it makes sense that they just shut down. And from you as yeah. a guide, I mean, you mentioned earlier in the show that you won't fish the same stretch too much. Do you have like a gut instinct or like a, a rule with that, like two days and rotate? Like, how do you do that? Yeah, you know, maybe a couple days in a row. And it depends because, you know, I'm not the only guide out there. Um, and we're certainly not the only people fishing out there. So, you know, I, I kind of, you know, gauge it off of that. Uh, you know, I'll get, I'll run a stretch maybe a couple days in a row. Uh, generally no more than, than three and then move on to another stretch. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it pays off. Sometimes it doesn't, um, you know, just in conversing with other guides, uh, you know, if I'm going to move off of a stretch and we all try to be, um, uh, Curious to each other, you know, as far as, um, you know, we're not going to run, you know, a, a three boat trip on water that there's going to be three other separate guides out there uh, just because it, it really takes a toll on the water, on the river and, and on the fish. I mean, and I can't stress that enough for people listening. Like, I think it goes like the Susquehanna, then maybe the main stem of the Upper Potomac, and then the Shenandoah is the smallest of the three by far. It is a really small yeah. place to to operate, and, and the pressure, yeah. oh, it's got to be terrible. Yeah. Um, tra Travis, you know, I really can't thank you enough for coming on. Um, I, I know you're busy, and you might not have any more bookings available for 2024, but <laughs> could you just give people a shout out of like what's available? Yeah, yeah. So. Uh Currently, I am booked all the way up to the 25th of May. Um, I've got a handful of uh, trips booked in June, but each day it just it seems like it's get you know I, I I gain more and more trips uh, you know a little bit further down the road. Uh, but yeah, you can find me on uh, on the on Instagram at uh, Kingfisher Guide Services and uh, same way on Facebook. And then uh, you can always go to my website, which is kfguideservices.com or wegofish.com, which is a little bit easier to remember. And you can always call me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm willing to entertain, uh, you know, anything, any ideas. And uh, I'm also willing to entertain, uh, you know, questions. You know, I, I answer a lot of questions for folks too, you know, like, Somebody will call up and say, hey, you know, I'm coming to the area. You know, I've got a half a day. You know, where's a good place to go fishing? And that's what it's all about, just to try to get people hooked on the sport. We are in such a unique area. And I talk about this with, with Captain Chief Taconis on the title where you have D.C. and Northern Virginia. So you have so many people that aren't outdoor savvy, I guess. I don't know how you would say it. So this is their yeah. chance to be introduced to it. Well, you know, and that's like, you know, if you, if you go anywhere – like, if you go on vacation, uh, you know, you're not going to go to the McDonald's to eat, right? You're going to no. go, you're, you might ask a local, somebody who lives there, say, hey, where's a good place to eat? And, you know, they're going to tell you, you know, like, uh, you know, generally they're going to tell you where, a, you know, a better restaurant is, or who knows, it might be some place that's, you know, on some back road that, uh, you know, isn't in your tour guide. That is, Yeah. That's spot on there. Uh, last question. Last question. You caught mm -hmm. well, well, that fish was six and a half ish. What are the odds in the next two or three years that you see a seven pounder? I think that's going to be tough, man, to see a seven pounder. I think it's possible that fish was, was six pounds on the nose. So maybe just a little hair over six pounds. Um, uh, but I, I just think that it's going to be tough to find a seven pounder. I would, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it, it would never happen, you know, because a six pound fish, you know, that's coming out of the winter into pre spawn. And, uh, you know, when the fish have that, have that heavy bag feed bag on. And, um, so yeah, that's, uh, I'm not going to rule it out, but it would be very, very tough. And I tell you what, a fish gets up to seven pounds, that fish is going to have a master's degree on eating bait. 
<laughs> that that is that is facts. That is a hundred percent facts. Travis, thank you so much again for coming on again, guys. Travis Eden, Kingfisher Guide Service, the man, the myth, the legend. Please go check him out. As always, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about. Uh, if you'd like to go check us out on Patreon uh, or listen to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, we're there as well. Like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host Thomas Aaron's. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.